All right, assalamu alaikum family. We are going to begin as customary with prayer, attention prayer. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Surely I am being turned to thee, O Allah, striving to be upright to him who originated the heavens and the earth, and I am not of the polytheist. Surely my prayer, my sacrifice, my life, and my death are all for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. No associate has he, and of this I am commanded, and I am of those who submit. O Allah, thou art the king, there is no God but thee. Thou art my Lord, and I am thy servant. I have been greatly unjust to myself, and I confess of my faults. So please grant me protection against all of my faults, for none grants protection against faults but thee. And guide me unto the best of morals, for none guides unto the best of morals but thee. And turn away from me the evil and the indecent morals, for none can turn away the evil and the indecent morals but thee. O Allah, make Muhammad successful and make the true followers of Muhammad successful, as thou did make Abraham and the true followers of Abraham successful. Surely thou art praised and magnified. And O Allah, bless Muhammad and bless the true followers of Muhammad, as thou did bless Abraham and the true followers of Abraham. Surely thou art praised and magnified. Amen. Alrighty, family, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. I would like to greet you all with the greeting words of peace and of paradise. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum salam. Wa alaykum salam, sir. We thank everybody for joining. Today we are joined by our dear brother and illustrious guest, Ilya Rashad, who is a student minister out of Muhammad Mosque number 55, who is also a member of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's research team and who has produced a number of publications that we all have public access to and who is also a beekeeper by profession, I believe. So we have today the subject, the battle in the sky is near. And just for anybody who may have questions, all you have to do is send them to Jeremy 2X or Sister Rachel, and we will do our best to get them answered as soon as possible. So without further ado for myself, I would like to welcome Student Minister Ilya Rashad. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you so, so, so much for having me on the master call once again. I'm very honored. All praise is due to Allah. So we'll jump right into the questions. The first question we have, it's an icebreaker. So we just want to know what is the battle in the sky? Wow. That's a big icebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> the battle in the sky is terminology that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad used in his writings and in some of his lectures, referring to that great battle against good or between good and evil, between God and Satan. It is part of the final uh, last part of the war of Armageddon that he said would take place in the sky. This um, involves um, planes and weaponry. And so this battle in the sky between good and evil, between God and Satan, will take place in the sky involving airplanes and aircraft and aerial assaults. Uh, but it also has spiritual significance as everything the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us does. You know, the sky is often synonymous with the minds, the heavens, the, uh, the thinking of the people, the spiritual realm, if you will. And so this battle between good and evil right now is taking place for the hearts and minds of the people. There is a battle taking place because Satan has, for the most part, the hearts and minds of the people, for it is written that Satan, that dragon, that beast, literally has deceived the whole world. So with the world under Satan's grasp, under Satan's influence, it is inevitable that a clash would take place 
because God has come to reclaim the hearts and minds and bodies of his people from under Satan's grasp. So that battle in the sky has both spiritual and literal significance. And this is what we see taking place all throughout the news, CNN and Fox. We read where NASA is expressing its uh, overt concerns of these unidentified flying objects, or as they call it, UAP. We've uh, witnessed over the last few years where the Senate and the Congress and the military have finally started to open up and share their concerns about the presence of these phenomenal and anomalous planes that have disturbed their sovereignty. So this battle in the sky that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Farrakhan have been warning us of is actually taking place right before our eyes if we're paying attention. Yes, sir. All praises due to Allah. Next question. And again, family, you can direct message your questions to Sister Rachel, DVR, Lehigh Valley, Sister Rachel in the chat, or Brother Jeremy 2X. Next question is, we've been taught that a percentage of wheels are not ours. Are they made as a distraction or are they from other planets? Well, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Farrakhan teach us about those 1,500 wheel-shaped planes that are from the huge mother plane or mother wheel that uh, the Nation of Islam has been espousing since the early 1930s. These, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation are clear, these represent the work of Allah. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad stated clearly that these planes from the mother plane represent uh, is the work of the mightiest God, Master Father Muhammad. So we're clear on uh, those 1500 wheel shaped planes that fly at phenomenal speeds and do all this miraculous maneuvers. These are the ones disturbing governments and militaries around the world. However, we understand that the enemy when I say the enemy, I'm talking about uh, governments and militaries led by the United States has in their attempts to reverse engineer what they've observed from these wheel shaped planes. And they have attempted to make in their assessment models, but they don't exhibit the characteristics that these real wheels take place. Uh, so the enemy does have his uh, technology and he's pretty advanced in it, you know, comparatively speaking, if you compare it to other militaries in the world, but their failed attempts are minuscule in comparison to the technology and the wisdom and power exhibited by these wheels uh, under the work of Master Father Muhammad. So, and I think it's important that as um, observers and as believers, we don't get mixed up into looking at any little um, uh, so-called sighting or encounter that you see on the internet or even see on the news, because a lot of the times the enemy will deliberately put out some fake hoaxes or CGI's or put out some of their uh, bogus attempts to, um, to replicate the wheels, if you will. So it's important that we don't get so caught up in assuming that every little thing we see in the sky is a wheel. You know, if it doesn't demonstrate the characteristics that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have been teaching us, then I would be cautious before readily assuming that anything we see in the sky is a wheel. And I really caution those of us who are believers 
in the nation of Islam, not to jump on these little bandwagons because you'll be taken for a ride uh, that you might not be able to swim back 9,000 miles. You know what I mean? You may <laughs> get caught up in believing something, thinking it's one of our wheels and you'll mess around and be falling for the enemy's tricks. Mm -hmm. So uh, we know what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Farrakhan represent to us, and we should hold fast to our position because everything that they are uh, concerned about, everything that NASA and the military, the Navy, CIA, the government is concerned about concerning these UAPs is directed at us, the nation of Islam and the God of the nation of Islam who introduced these wheel-shaped crafts to the world. So let's be clear on that. All praises due to Allah. Excellent answer. And I think that was an excellent reminder as well. Praise be to Allah. Uh, question is, um, why is the battle in the sky relevant to black people? And before you answer, um, can you go into in terms of that question, both natures, you know, you said it's physical, the battle in the sky is physical, but it's also spiritual. Can you go into the relevance of the battle in the sky in that regard? Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you so much for these questions. You know, Black people in particular should be anxious as heck. <laughs> you know what I want to say. We should be overtly anxious to learn more, to follow the representation of these crafts called UFOs, that they call UFOs. Because think about it, black people who have suffered more hell than pretty much any people on this earth who have undergone the worst type of trauma through the transatlantic slave trade and the continued exploitation and colonialization and just dehumanization of a people who have undergone what no other people on this planet have undergone now, we should be first and foremost anxious like heck to know that there is a power in the world that is greater than our oppressors. Come on. Look at it. Black folks, with all the talk that we talk, and, you know, we can talk some of that stuff now. We know that we need to overcome the oppressor. We know we need to overcome this world of white supremacy. But let's be real. Black folks, especially black folks in America, you don't have the weaponry or the arsenal to go against this enemy's military or any other militaries of the Western world. The At best, we got some pop guns, some little AK-47s and whatnot. You don't have no tanks. You don't have any aerial assaults. You don't have any drones like that. You don't have any B-2 bombers and all this type of stuff. You, have, you don't have nuclear weapons at your disposal, but your enemy does. So if there is not a power greater than the power of our enemies, you might as well give up because there, there would be no hope. But what the nation of Islam represents is proof that there is a power in the world, a military power in the world that is proven to be far greater than our oppressors. Because history and facts have shown us that these wheels have been destabilizing America's most advanced nuclear weapon sites. These wheels that Master Father Muhammad had developed for us for me and you, for our people, these wheels have proven to shut down uh, bombers and disassemble nuclear weapons missiles in midair. These wheels, which is proof of God's presence, proof of his military prowess, have been demonstrating their superiority since at least the 1940s. This is what has the militaries all upset. And they're just now coming forth with it. So the fact is, there is a power in the world that is greater than the white man. So if Black folks knew better, we would run like hell. Well, run like heaven. 
to come and stand with the representative of that power, which is clearly represented by the Honorable Minister Farah Khan. You know, and when we talk like this, we must understand that we're not just um, mouthing off some religious rhetoric. Right. Rather, what we are doing is showcasing and highlighting that which is empirically grounded. We're talking about facts here. Nothing we're saying about the reality of these wheels and their uh, demonstrating their power over America's nuclear armory. Nothing we're saying is not true. It can all be proven, you know? So for black people, if we got sense, tell you straight up, if we have as much sense as I know we do, we would be rushing to stand with the Honorable Minister Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam and wanting to become more acquainted with this superior power. And we can show and prove where that power, um, what's the source behind that power. And spoiler alert, it's Almighty God Allah who came in the person of Master Father Muhammad. If you doubt that, just come study with us. We can prove it to you. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Brother Ilya. Um, we wanted to. Y'all got uh, me preaching already, man. I was trying <laughs> to keep it. I was trying to keep it cool, man. That's why you're here, I'm brother. All the, I'm all on the master call. I'm trying to keep it professional. Y'all got me with these good questions already, man. <laughs> no, this 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 is the place, brother. You don't you don't got to be too uh politically correct. <laughs> no, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, we praise be to Allah. We wanted to double back to the previous question because you touched on us not getting too uh, antsy when saying, you know, oh, this is a wheel that I just saw. Um, somebody asked, can you give us an example of what is not our, oh, hold on, <laughs> chat moved. Can you give us an example of what is not our planes and what is? Um, since you touched on uh, the characteristics, you know, how the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says they move. Yes, yes, certainly. Well, a lot of the times the things that come across um, our feeds on the Internet, sometimes it's pretty ambiguous and, and we can't tell unless we were there or, you know, it's a case by case basis. However, there are certain characteristics that are solid. For starters, he referred to these circular planes as wheels, which implies that they are for the most part circular in nature, not rectangular, not triangles. So when we see all these other things, different crazy shapes and it's a so-called triangle stuff, that might not be a wheel right there, <laughs> okay? And simple things like that is very important to note uh, I'll share with you something that the Honorable Minister Farrakhan shared with me that I think is priceless in terms of wisdom. Years ago, we were blessed to meet with him concerning this matter. And one of the things he said to me, he stated, and I'm almost quoting him, I'm at least paraphrasing. He said, brother, your job is not to try to explain what somebody else said or what somebody else saw or claim they saw, you know what I mean? Because they could be making stuff up, they could be lying, they could be hoaxing. So it's not my or our job to try to explain what somebody else may have saw or think they saw or said. No, he said, your job is to explain what he, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said and taught, you see? Because he is the source of this wisdom. He is the source of this phenomena. He is the one that introduced this reality to the modern world and is on record for it. So if we're gonna explain some, let's start with the source. And that takes us to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I don't think that wisdom that the honorable minister Farrakhan shared was for me. He told it to me, but that is for all of us. Let's make sure that we don't get so caught up trying to explain what somebody, the latest report is. Here they are talking about some uh, alien mummy in Mexico and we get all caught up in this, <laughs> in this nonsense and stuff like that, you know? So 
Just remember those powerful, they were, those words were so simplistic yet so powerful. Brother, your job is not to explain what they said or came up with. No, your job is to explain what he taught. You see, that's wisdom right there. So we don't, we don't get caught up with all these triangles and whatnot. And even when the Senate and NASA give their discussions and, you know, NASA just gave a discussion recently on their uh, position and <clears throat> inquiries concerning unidentified flying objects. And I listened to most of it. And as I was listening, brothers, I was like, man, these folks ain't talking about nothing. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm like, really? Because what they do, all of these so-called uh, leaders and professionals and scientists who pretend to be so concerned about unidentified flying objects and UAP, yet they deliberately do everything in their power to avoid those who have the answers. And I'm telling you straight up before the world and anybody else, the nation of Islam has the answer to what you call the UFO phenomena. In fact, the nation of Islam answered this phenomena before the world even had questions. So it would only be wise if these people are truly sincere about their UAP, UFO inquiries. If they are really sincere, they would just straight up come to us who provide answers. And our answers are not limited to some, you know, religious belief. Our answers are the most pragmatic, the most grounded, uh, that's verifiable, not just in our records, but heck, in their records. <laughs> it's, in the, it's in their FBI records where they question uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad about these wheels. And for all these years, they've been paying a special attention to Elijah Muhammad's teachings concerning these wheel-shaped planes. So don't, don't act like, you know, all of a sudden, yes, we're trying to find out uh, what these uh, anomalous objects are that have been violating our airspace. And please think about it. This information is right there in the declassified FBI files. So if the declassified FBI files that the public has access to shows that the FBI and the government um, were concerned with the Nation of Islam's association with these wheels as a matter of national security, what the hell do these so-called leaders, intelligence and military leaders look like discussing UAP and UFOs and not get to the source? No, that's deliberate. And you know, it's, it's kind of funny to see the hypocrisy involved in so-called UFO research, you know? Even if they were to um, disagree, even if they felt like, well, we don't believe you Muslims, we don't think you all are connected to this phenomena, that at the very least, it would be wise to check and challenge to see if what we're saying is valid or not. But you know, they're too afraid to do that. The little old nation of Islam has world leaders scared as hell to involve us in a topic that we have the answers to. And this is why those of us who are followers of the Honorable Minister Farah Khan, not to be arrogant, but we should stick our chest out because we got some real juice with us. Come on. You know, we got some real juice with us. The fact that we are those bold and wise enough to stand with the representative of that power. And we're little old brothers and sisters who are bold and wise enough to stand with the Honorable Minister Farrakhan are putting world scholars and leaders to flight. They are literally afraid to even dialogue with us. That's something to really put into perspective. You know, people ask me all the time, you know, colleagues and friends of mine, they're like, you know, Brother Rashad, you uh, 
you're pretty heavy on this UFO stuff, man. And the nation of Islam, why, why don't they ever talk to y'all on, you know, the history channel or why don't they interview you all on the news or bring you all before the Congress and question you all about this. And I'm like, if you only knew, <laughs> see, that's exactly what we had talked about um, before. It's literally a conspiracy of silence. A conspiracy of silence is when a group of people, for whatever reason, agree not to publicly discuss a certain topic, you know, for no reason. They have to make sure that they do not discuss certain topics. When it comes to UFOs and the Nation of Islam, that is an off limits topic. The most powerful entities and governments and personnel and agencies that and leaders, they'll talk about anything. They'll talk about their perception of UFOs. They may talk about the Nation of Islam, but the two together, which are directly correlated, they cannot allow the public to make the connection between UFOs and the Nation of Islam. This is why, ironically, you don't hear the topic come up, particularly in UFO research. And you would think that as, as criticized and as scrutinized as the Nation of Islam is, and I don't think there's any group uh, more scrutinized and surveillance and even targeted from governmental and media uh, personnel than the Nation of Islam. But yet, even though we're the most scrutinized, the most criticized, nobody, even our staunchest enemies and critics won't even bring up the topic. That's because if, if they do, if an objective study is given to the topic of UAP, UFOs, there's no logical way that you can approach this subject, you know, with logic and practicality and not be led to the nation of Islam, you see? So that's the challenge that we have for the leaders and scholars of the world. Stop being afraid, you know? I mean, we, we ain't gonna bite. All we can do is just tell you the truth. And just because we can prove it and it's so mathematically sound, don't get mad at us, just accept the truth. God came, he showed Elijah Muhammad this wheel, and this wheel is the most powerful masterpiece of mechanics that you can imagine, and it proves that Minister Farrakhan is backed by God. I mean, just admit it. All the evidence points that way anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all, I keep talking. Y'all, it's y'all fault. Y'all got me preaching this morning. <laughs> well, we won't. That's what we want. I mean, thus far, I hope everybody is enjoying the, the responses that we're getting because I know I am personally. And this is exactly why we brought you on because we knew you was coming with straight heat. And on that note, various times you've mentioned the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is the representative of that power, you know, in our midst. And so before this question, I would like to preface it with this quote from the Umar Reflects podcast, March 23rd, the beginning of Ramadan, when we heard from the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. He said, the Muslims in the West who have been guided by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was taught by the great Mahdi, we do not have any carnal weapons. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad told us, do not use the carnal weapons of this world. He, Master Far Muhammad, came to protect us, and he brought a weapon with himself, a great wheel that is seen throughout the earth now. It has visited all of the installations in America of, of atomic and nu nuclear weapons, and some of them it put out of commission to show America that we have the power to shut down what you have made for destruction. This is a great will that is like a city in the sky. 
and that will is referred to in the Bible as the New Jerusalem. The old Jerusalem is finished as a guide for the human family. Now, the question in correlation to, like you said, he's the representative of that power. The question is, tomorrow is the 38th year anniversary of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's more than a vision like experience. How has this vision contributed to the evolution of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and his mission? Wow, wow. That's some powerful stuff there, brother. You know, since the more than a vision experience of the Honorable Minister Farrakhan on September 17th, 1985 in Tepochtlan, Mexico, that was an event that literally would change the course of history, not just for him, not just for his followers, but literally for the world. Because in that experience, he received divine revelation. He became the recipient of divine revelation where he uh, received the words of the honorable Elijah Muhammad, a man who the world believes is dead, keep in mind, you know, and those words and what was put in him what I like to use the term was downloaded or uploaded into him through the scroll and through the honorable Elijah Muhammad was the guidance and revelation that has predicated everything that he's done thus far. So he knew from the guidance of the honorable Elijah Muhammad on the wheel that the presidents, the highest echelons of uh, government office Wars were being planned. And every president, every administration since then has been planning wars, particularly against Muslims and black youth. Initially, he realized that that war was targeted against Libya. And so in 1986, Minister Farrakhan literally flew to Libya where he espoused his more than a vision experience to more than 80 world leaders while in Libya. And word got to Colonel Gaddafi and Colonel Gaddafi was able to barely escape at that time, a gruesome aerial assault from the United States government that ended up killing Muammar Gaddafi's, one of his daughters through a, a bomb that America sent down at one of his compounds. So the warning that the Honorable Minister Farrakhan has shared from his experience has been a saving grace for the world. It was that experience, knowing that there was a war against black youth, against uh, black men with this so-called war on drugs that broke up families, the crack epidemic, all of this started taking place uh, around the time and after the minister's experience. So he knew that he had to warn the world. It was that experience that prompted Minister Farrakhan in the late 80s and early 90s to crisscross this country on a stop the killing tour, where he would go to all of these cities encouraging our people to stop the fratricide, stop the killing. And he was bringing unity between rival gangs and street organizations, forging unity between uh, rival, even religious sects throughout America. And it was during that same time that Hollywood and the Jewish influenced media were frequently portraying black men as savages, you know, all throughout the Congress and the political realm, they were describing black youth as these super predators, you know? And it's because of this negative image of black men and black youth being characterized as savage beasts. This image was being portrayed all around the world. An image that was used to try to justify the outright slaughter of our people. But it was Minister Farrakhan 
that great champion, that great battler, that great warrior that God put on his heart to go around the country and forge unity with these rival gangs. But you know, the US government considers that a threat. When you bring and forge love and unity among black people, like never seen before the way the Honorable Minister Farrakhan has done, that's considered dangerous to white America. And the icing on the cake occurred on October 16th, 1995, as Minister Farrakhan toured the country once again in the 1994-95, speaking mostly to black men, encouraging black men to assume their responsibility, their divine responsibilities as the husbands, as the fathers, as the brothers, as the leaders of our communities. And that led to the Million Man March, the largest, most peaceful demonstration of black unity in the history of the modern world. I mean, literally a miracle in our midst convened and organized by the Honorable Minister Farrakhan. And you know what's funny? You barely even read about it in most history books. Look, I'm a public school educator. And in most public schools, the regular history books, they don't mention anything of that because black love and black unity is a threat to white world supremacy. And since the Honorable Minister Farrakhan is the most effective proponent of our unity and black love, he is the number one threat. So they have to make sure that our youth know nothing about Minister Farrakhan because to even hear him is life changing. It is life altering. But going back to the premise, everything that Minister Farrakhan has done since then, all of these miracles that he's performed, the Million Man March, the Million Family March, the Millions More Movement, 10, 10, 15, Justice or else, every time bringing about a million or more people to the nation's capital in peace and in unity, you know, with the American government and the Jewish controlled media against him. Yet he's still effective and he's telling the whole world that he is backed by this mighty God who controls that wheel that they call UFOs. Man, look, I, I've worked as a journalism instructor and in journalism, there are certain key things that determine if a story is considered newsworthy or not. You know, things like how timely it is, uh, the proximity that it is, the relevance that it has on uh, human life, the impact that it has on world affairs. And when you look at it, there is no, I don't think there's a more newsworthy topic than the fact that God came and brought proof of his power in the presence of these so-called UFOs that are represented by Minister Farrakhan. The most newsworthy topic in the world, but nobody want to talk about it. Boy, I tell you the truth. <laughs> but everything the minister has done, all these miracles have been based on that premise of that experience, the guidance he received from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You know, so this is just one of many reasons why I say September 17th, it's a holy day in our book because that was a day that literally changes the course of history. The world was impacted by the Million Man March. The world has been impacted by the voice of the Honorable Minister Farrakhan. Black people, brown people, Heck, the government has been impacted because they've never been able to deal with what they consider an anomalous figure like Minister Farrakhan because they've never had a voice like his that they've not been able to tame or control, you see? So his life, his works, his experience, all of this is changing the course of history. So September 17th, that's a holy day in our book. Yes, sir.
you made some very good points just now, Brother Elia Rashad. All praises due to Allah. Um, and message to the black man. At the bottom of page 17, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, speaking of Master Far Muhammad, said, he pointed out a destructive, dreadful looking plane that is made like a wheel in the sky today. It is a half mile by a half mile square. It is a humanly built plane. It is up there and can be seen twice a week. It is no secret. We wanted to ask you, and I would like to personally ask you, if you don't have the answer for this, I, I, I would like for you to ask the minister. <laughs> How can we see the mother wheel twice a week and have you ever seen, do you believe you've, you've ever seen the mother plane? So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in those words said that it can be, it can be seen twice a week. Seen by who? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and the fact is there are sightings every day, especially in today's time when Everybody has smartphones and cameras that can capture moments and capture videos and take pics and things like that. Whether they get reported or not, the fact is there are hundreds, dare I say thousands of sightings every day, certainly every week. So if it's sighted, I don't know by who, I don't think that necessarily means is it can be sighted by one person at a set time, you know, because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad also said that this plan can go anywhere in space that it wants now. You know, it's not limited to the earth. It comes to earth, you know, because this is the home. This is the footstool of God. You know, this is the home of God, really. But his throne or his uh, sovereignty encompasses everything in creation. So he's not limited uh, just to earth now. He has a whole universe and worlds that he tends to. He's the Lord of all the worlds, but this is his home and Allah grants us the favor and the blessing of being able to know that we have this power, his power with us, which is why it has been cited and has been seen so frequently. And I personally, I don't cognitively know if I've seen the wheel and I knew it was the mother plane, I have, however, been blessed to see um, sightings of these smaller wheels on quite a few occasions over the years. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to have done so. But I'll tell you, Brother Javon, Brother Demetrius, and all others who are listening, if I never seen a wheel, a baby plane, or the mother plane, it would make no difference because all the facts prove that it's there anyway. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, I, I like to use this example. I've, uh, I've never been to China. Now, I would sound real foolish if I said China don't exist just because I haven't been there. <laughs> you know what I mean? So just as there are a billion people in China, there's about a billion people that have seen these wheels. You know, some have reported it, some have not reported it. When you look at over the years since the 30s, all over the globe, yeah, hundreds of millions, dare I say billions, who've seen either the wheel or these planes. So whether you or I personally see them or not, it matters not. You know, the mathematics and the reality proves that it's, it's real. And the God behind this, magnificent masterpiece of mechanics is also real. And I glad you brought that up because far too many people try to use the excuse of not accepting the plain truth just because they haven't personally saw it. As though you have to personally see something to believe it. You know, don't bring that foolishness to us. You know, you have a lot of people like that. Uh, they feel like unless one of the wheels come to their front door and dance around and do all of this and be like, hey, it's me, look at me, look what I can do and shoot off, then and only then will you believe. What, man? 
uh, a lot and his scientists who control the wheels are not reliant on us to believe <laughs> in order for them to exist. In fact, we would be foolish. You know, this is a day and time where the information is so vast. The evidence is so overwhelming that we would look like a fool if we didn't believe these planes exist. And that's why nobody want to talk to us these days. Because now since all the evidence proves that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Farrakhan Khan have been right and exact this whole time, that's why nobody want to deal with us now. Because they're going to have to admit Yes, the nation of Islam been right the whole time. And for the most part, that's a pretty hard pill to swallow. I don't think most people gonna want to do that. Even though the evidence proves it, it's just, it's a hard pill to swallow. All praise is due to Allah. Thank you for that answer, sir. Our next question is from the chat and it says, Assalamu alaikum. Where does it mention the wheels in the Hadith? And I will also add to that the Quran as well. I'm sorry. <laughs> Repeat that again. <laughs> I was getting a, getting a call from Chicago. I'm sorry. <laughs> Could you repeat that for me? My apologies. No worries. So the question is, where does it mention the wheels in the Hadith? And for those who may be watching who don't know what Hadith is, it's the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I said, I will also add to that the Quran as well. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the Holy Quran, as well as the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, also known as the Hadith, makes several references to. Allah being seen and to some type of dwelling place of Allah. It is considered, um, I forget the Arabic term, it's like uh, the Beit al uh, it'll come to me. But when the Prophet Muhammad had his night journey where he was taken from uh, Mecca to Jerusalem, and then from Jerusalem up into the heavens where he visited the inner sanctum of Allah, where he had a meeting with his Lord. This was some type of physical location because the angels are said to go in and out of this uh, place where Allah dwells. They didn't use the term wheel necessarily, but it is considered a house of Allah, another house of Allah. And it's also mentioned in the Holy Quran in Surat Al-Najm, the 53rd Surah of the Holy Quran, where it gives us a prophetic meeting between Allah and his servant. You know, a place described in the farthest horizon. It's the farthest in the farthest horizon near the farthest loak tree, which means that it has some earthly qualities to it. Must be a civilization up there, but it is a place where Allah dwells. Elsewhere in the Holy Quran, we are uh, we read where Allah seems to be accompanied by his exalted assembly. Look at that. An exalted assembly of angels or helpers, because Allah has a staff working for him. And it's funny because the Muslim scholars, sometimes called the ulema, they really don't know how to explain these type of things mentioned in the Quran, as well as in the Hadith, that clearly show that Allah has physical characteristics and attributes. According to the hadith, several hadith, Allah clearly has a form. He has a body, he has a shin, he has hands, he laughs, he smiles, he will be seen according to the Quran and the hadith. For I'm reminded, and this is in several reliable hadith, uh, where some of the companions asked the prophet about a certain ayat in the Quran in Surat Al-Qiyamah, 
which is the 75th surah of the Holy Quran, wherein it tells us that on that day, talking about the day of resurrection, their faces will be radiant, bright and radiant, looking at their Lord. So there will literally come a time when Allah will be able to be seen. This is in the Quran. And so the companions of the prophet are asking him about this particular ayat. And so they asked him, dear apostle, dear prophet, Rasulullah, will we uh, be able to see our Lord Allah on, on that day when this time comes, like the Quran says? And the prophet replied, he said, can you see the moon when there are no clouds in the sky? They were like, yes. And he also asked him, can you see the sun during the day, during clear skies? They were like, of course, yes, sir. He said, then surely you too on that day will be able to see your Lord just as clear as you see the moon, clear as you see the sun, Allah will be able to be seen. So if Allah will be able to be seen, clearly he has physical attributes. But Allah tells us in the Quran, he is referred to frequently as uh, al-ghaib, the unseen. That term is used to describe Allah throughout the Quran. And it's interesting to note that that term al-ghaib does not mean that Allah cannot be seen because that term means to be hidden, to be withdrawn from, to be removed from or absent from. So Allah can be seen, he just chooses not to be seen until that day, the day of resurrection, when all eyes will see him as the Bible says, and as the Quran says, their faces will be bright and radiant, looking at their Lord. Oh, we thank Allah so much for fulfilling his own prophecies. And he revealed himself to that one who was the first to see and recognize his Lord, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he in turn represents to us that God that has been seen, that can be seen, and his power can be seen, heard and felt today. And what you call the UFO phenomenon. Man, y'all gonna have me preaching in a minute, boy. <laughs> um, oh, it's too late, brother. All <laughs> praise is due to Allah. Um, <laughs> next question. We got a couple of them lined up for you. We're making good time here. This is good. This is good. So it says, in Savior's Day 2011, there was a conference where many of the minister's friends were able to witness wheels all over the world. Were you present? And if so, what did you learn? Thank you. I was present. Uh, of course, at that time, I was present in the audience. And these were uh, scientists, some friends, some associates, and some just scientists that, were, that we invited to come share. And we um, allowed them to share things really from their perspective, you know? because we have the answers to the UFO phenomena, but we wanted to invite some of those who have been studying this thing, many of whom are scientists. So we wanted them to come and share their thoughts and their findings with the believing body. You know, the Honorable Minister Farrakhan is in no way intimidated by scholarship or anything like that. He actually invites people to come and share their thoughts, to share their findings, to share their views with us. And so these scientists, and I think there are close to maybe 10 or 11 of them, uh, came and shared uh, a lot of good information, some of which they shared involved some of the, um, I guess I would say scientific procedures that has said to been that some abductees had undergone and they had found what seemed to be foreign traces of or objects embedded in their skin or in their bodies that they don't know if it came from this earth or or, or what 
uh, there was a lot of things that were shared that I think was uh, just very useful, very valuable, especially that which came from a scientific perspective. Of course, these were people from all over the world, and some of them shared some of their own views and their own analysis, which is fine. Of course, we don't have to agree with everything that they shared. Some of them, you know, uh, had the belief that these may be of alien origins because they don't know. And they don't have to know. We just wanted them to share what they thought they know and share some of their findings with the believing community. And we're very grateful for what they did. So uh, I did, I was able to take away something from that conference. And um, uh, I thank the Honorable Minister Farrakhan and the Executive Council for uh, having the gall to invite those uh, to our conference. and up to that time, and it may still stand, but at that time, that was the largest UFO conference that America has ever had. Savior's Day, 2010, 2011, when those scientists came, when we had as part of a plenary session, that um, inadvertently became the largest UFO conference in America. And it may still be the largest that they've ever had, thanks to the Nation of Islam. All praise is due to Allah. You know, there's a saying, you learn something new every day, because I did not know that, but praise be to Allah. Definitely good information. And I believe that conference is also still available on YouTube, I believe, um, but I have to verify. Next yeah, question. They, they take a, they've taken most of our stuff down, believe it or not, you know. We, yeah. we shadow ban pretty pretty bad, bro. <laughs> and that kind of goes with you saying that. That literally goes into our next question. So, mm. it's, I'm going to preface it with a quote once again. This is from the address. Uh, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan addresses the Yay and Irving controversy. Um, it took place November 10th, 2022, and he opens with these words: "Greetings to you. I am Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan." National Representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I am speaking this morning to you on behalf of my teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I am sure that my teacher, who is presently on the wheel, these unidentified by others flying objects that are present in this world to bring about the judgment of God. And he goes from there. And that is on media. NOI.org for anybody who wants to hear the full message. So with him saying that he's addressing the Yay and Irving controversy with the Jewish community, and we know that really since that has taken place with Yay and Kyrie Irving with the Jews, majority of the masses of the people are no longer ignorant as we once were to the Jewish influence, power, and control. So I wanted to ask you personally, what what does the the role of the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan and his unmasking Satan and exposing the synagogue of Satan play in the battle in the sky? It is essential because the battle in the sky is between God and Satan. But Satan has to be identified. Satan has to be unmasked. That is a job specifically, specifically designated to God's Messiah. This is why you don't find other leaders standing in the position that the Honorable Minister Farrakhan is in. Oh, certainly our leaders, they'll talk about injustice and they'll talk about, you know, racism and we need to stand against racism and white supremacy and injustice, but they'll only go so far. They're not going to deal with the head and the gatekeepers who have this stranglehold of white supremacy on the American people and the world. Because in order to do that, you have to identify that prevalent Jewish element. And that's what distinguishes Minister Farrakhan from all these other leaders, black or white. Many of them are just too afraid. Many of them just are too ignorant. 
And again, many of them are just too afraid. <laughs> but Minister Farrakhan is like that David in the Bible who was a prototype of the Messiah. David was the only one willing to challenge Goliath when all the other so-called people of Israel were afraid. They were supposed to be soldiers, but they were afraid to battle Goliath. But it was this little sweet David child, the one singing and playing his harp and all of that, who had a love for his people. See, it was he that God used and chose to battle Goliath. And he didn't battle Goliath the way the rest of the army thought he should. You know, in the Bible, it says they tried to give David Saul's armament and his hillmen and all of this. And David was like, look, man, I, I don't fight with that. He went to the brook and all he got was that one stone, which the Honorable Minister Farrakhan and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad tell us represent belief in Allah. And it's David using that one stone that was used to slay Goliath. And notice, in this biblical story, David doesn't just aim for any part of Goliath. He doesn't aim for the head. He doesn't, I mean, he doesn't aim for the arm or the legs or the feet or the hands. He goes straight for the head. So the Honorable Minister Farrakhan, knowing that in order for our people to be free from the clutches of Satan, you got to go straight for the head. And who's at the head of this world? Who's at the head of Hollywood? and the mass media, who runs Hollywood and the media? Who runs and influences the banking and financial markets and these industries? Jew. Yeah, you gotta deal with that Jewish element. Sure. Who influences political policies, both domestic and foreign? Jews, Jews like APAC and the ADL and all of these things. Who influences educational curriculum? Simon Wiesenthal Center, ADL, Jews, That's right. Farrakhan, that great battler like David, he's aiming for the head. He's going for those at the top of this world of white supremacy. And that is exactly the synagogue of Satan. See, that's the job of the Messiah. That's why none of these leaders even have the gall to do what the honorable minister Farrakhan is doing. That clearly distinguishes him that's why you know uh, and can recognize part of his divinity because he's the only one really challenging Satan face to face. Come and on, it now. is only, it is only when we deal with that element can our people be free. So we can't claim to be leaders. Hell, we can't even claim to be good shepherds if we don't attack or challenge those who sit uh, at the head. And that brings us to that Jewish element of power. So if you're really concerned about freeing your people and you're not challenging the ADL, Southern Poverty Law Center, Simon Wiesenthal Center, the Jewish lobbying groups, the Jewish Congress, all of these Jewish entities that pretty much influence world industries. Oh. So you don't talk that stuff. Yeah, you good at marching and protesting with yeah, police brutality. That's good. But if you're not dealing with the head, it's almost like it's good for nothing. So if you're really concerned about social justice, you're really concerned about change, you know, stand with the man who's doing the real deal work. That's the messianic work of the Honorable Minister Farrakhan. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on, brother Elia. We needed that Thank part of the interview. We <laughs> needed that part. We ain't just up Thank here stargazing. So <laughs> <laughs> next question. Uh, the, the, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, excuse me, has the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan ever described to you what he saw on the wheels or any of the details of the interior of the wheel when he visited it? You know, the Honorable Minister Farrakhan is such a transparent person. And anything that he has said to me, 
And I've been blessed to speak with him about this topic on several occasions. But anything that he's said to me, he's already shared with the public. You have probably heard the same thing more than I have. When he shared his experience, and think about it, since his experience in 85 of September, he's pretty much been sharing and talking about it every year. Yes, <laughs> every major opportunity he gets, he's telling the world about his experience, you know, which is crazy, which, I mean, and you still don't hear critics talking about it. Again, another subject for another time, maybe. But no, what the minister has shared is um man what the public has heard and i think it's important that we take hold to every word every syllable that he shares with us uh, about this topic and any other topics now i do recall something that i was thinking about earlier today and that was october 9th 2015 in washington dc this is the day before 10, 10, 15, which was the 20th or 25th, 20th anniversary of the Million Man March. And I was in a meeting in the hotel suite and we happened to be at the JW Marriott in Washington, DC. And if you don't know, the JW Marriott is the same facility that the minister gave his uh, the great announcement press conference in 1989, where he disclosed to the world in an international press conference what had taken place in his more than a vision experience. And of course, back in 89, it was right after he gave that powerful press conference that he issued a warning to America and the world that if they wished to mock him, because of his connection to these wheels, that they would see these wheels, or what they call UFOs, over the major cities of America. And lo and behold, 24 hours didn't go by without these wheels cutting up right there over Washington, DC, right there over next door in Baltimore. They had it running on the local news for about three days straight about these unidentified crafts that had been seen over Washington, D.C., seen over the White House, seen over uh, these halls of justice. And interestingly, of all their talk on the news for about two or three days straight, they made sure they didn't say nothing about Minister Farrakhan, who had just warned the world the, the uh, day prior. You see, that's part of that conspiracy of silence. But Anyway, 10 9 15, the day before 10 10 15, we're in the hotel suite at the JW Marriott. And I reminded the apostle, I said, Dear minister, you know, it was in this same month, October, in this same facility, the JW Marriott, that you gave that powerful announcement before the world and the wheels that showed up right afterwards. And the apostle, the honorable minister Farrakhan responded to me and said, you know, brother, it may be that we might receive a visit. And lo and behold, after I left, probably an hour or two later, he had left the hotel suite, went up to the balcony of the JW Marriott. And lo and behold, a huge ominous cloud came and hovered over the Honorable Minister Farrakhan and hovered over that part of the city in the hotel, almost as if to say, I'm here. Mm. And you've, you've probably seen a picture or two that had been taken. If, um, if not, I'll try to post it or something like that. Um, but yes, and it's funny because I remember vividly prior to like two days before, I'm looking at the weather in Washington, D.C. on my phone, the weather forecast. And the weather forecast clearly had that it was supposed to storm on 10, 10, 15 on Washington, D.C. That was on the 
on the uh, in the weather forecast. I want to say I screenshot it and I hope I did. <laughs> but needless to say, the weather seemed a bit ominous the day before because that huge cloud came over the city and different people have different angles. And that cloud was, uh, there was a serious cloud. That was like a cloud by day right there. Okay. And um, yeah, that was really strange because the minister had just said, it may be that we might receive a visit. And he went up there and got those pictures of him just looking at this huge cloud shaped like a wheel. You know, I'm just letting you know that, look, the wheel follows him everywhere he goes anywhere. Anyway, if not the wheel, these wheels follow him. He has scientists, angels assigned to him, you know, and he's made that public several times. And there are several, several other uh, occasions where he has called for these wheels and they showed up on the national scene. You know, this is why you can't talk to anybody like us. Those of us who think and try to think mathematically, try to think with a sound mind and be quite practical. Look, all the evidence proves that Minister Farrakhan has to be the man of God. I mean, that's not even like something we have to guess. If you know the facts, and you compare these facts to all of the messianic prophecies, you would have no choice other to, than to bear witness that this something about this brother Farrakhan, because everything about what he says and does is straight up messianic in nature. We ought to be thankful that we can stand with a man like that. All praise is yes, due to all. I know I'm thankful. I thank a lot every day. My God. So our next question is, we know you have a, and that's what I was over here looking for. It's not popping out to me right now, but I, I do have your book, um, UFOs and the Nation of Islam. I wanted to show it real quick, but I can't see it. Um, and then you also have, yes, sir. I'll let, let him grab that real quick. There we go. Hey. Little advertising, huh? Yes, perfect. So you have the book. It's UFOs and the Nation of Islam, the source, proof, and what is that? And reality and of the reality. Week. Yes, yes. So you have that book, and then you also just recently launched your new series, Unanswered. And answered. I, An answered. Yes. Answered. We want to make sure we're clear on that answer. And I believe the episode that we saw was just a prelude, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. That's correct. So Thank you for bringing I, that up, too. Yes, yes. And I believe that's on media.noi.org as well um, for viewing to the public. And we did have recent showings just a few weeks ago. So I wanted to ask, this is a two-part question. What was the production like of this series? of this episode and then what was the feedback that you've gotten not just from the public but also from the honorable minister lewis farrakhan Ooh, thank you i think you might be one of the first person to ask that question uh you know on a public forum anyway i'll start with the production there's a lot of work that went into and that goes into a production like that it's a lot of work um from the traveling to the recording to the collaboration with different people and that's why i'm so thankful for uh all of those involved you know and while i'm on that the honorable minister farrakhan told me that everybody who was a part of this documentary project he said they were divinely sent <laughs> you know and not just those who were in front of the camera that's why i'm so thankful to our great sister dr ava may allah be pleased with our powerful sister she like everybody else 
was so enthused when I even asked her to be a part of this project. She was like one of the first and she was so happy and like, it was like she was happier than me, <laughs> you know? It's almost like she could see where this thing was going. So um, she was one of the first that we interviewed. And, you know, we went to Chicago and Minister Ishmael, Dr. Wesley, I mean, they were all so gracious and so enthused and excited um, and welcoming to be a part of this project. I mean, and you have to take into consideration these are uh, national laborers, the executive council, they have strenuous schedules. Man, I'm talking about, so the fact that they would even take time and gladly take time move things out of their schedule to be with us for this production. I'm so thankful to those like Brother Warren of First Work Media and the whole Final Call production staff, Brother Hawk and his wife and uh, man, Brother D. Rowe, Brother Daryl. Um, shoot, and you know, that boy there's a beast behind that camera. <laughs> Brother Daryl D. Rowe and several others. Um, you know, it's a lot of work, a lot of scheduling you know, a lot of our own little money we had to come up with to do things. And even with the editing, and I did probably 95% of the editing myself. And that's what the hard part is. And it takes time. It takes, you know, focus and whatnot. But I'm thankful, thankful, thankful of what it uh, we've been able to produce and where this is going for the upcoming episodes. And I'll tell you this, this is the inside scoop. Minister Farrakhan called me like 30 seconds after he watched it. I was in Chicago preparing to do the lecture a few months ago at Mas Mariam. That Saturday, I was in the hotel in Chicago getting prepared the day before when I received a call from the apostle. And the minister had in words expressed how he was excited and then he said he was going to get me. He said he was going to give me a whooping for something. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> and But he, he was so excited because he had told me he had just watched the documentary. And he said that he was not even able to finish his coffee. He said he had his iPad and had his coffee and he pushed play and he was looking at it. He said he was so engrossed in every minute of it. He was into every second and every minute of it that he couldn't even, he never did even sip his coffee. He said he could not put it down. And he said that after he watched it, he had to call me immediately. He said he had to take about 30 seconds to get himself together because he said that he cried at least three times while watching it. And then he called me and he said that he was going to give me a whooping. I said, well, what, dear minister, well, like what I do? He was like, he was kind of upset over the fact that he was not the first one to see it. <laughs> I'm like, Phew. and I, was, I let him know that, you know, dear minister, I, I did send it to you. But of course, I sent it to him and the executive council. But it was like right before Savior's Day and everybody was too busy, you know rightfully so. And so he was thankful that I even understood that. But uh, the minister was so, so, so pleased. And this is what touches my heart. Because the minister expressed to me that this documentary, this project answered, he referred to it as the vindication of our nation. He referred to this work as the vindication of our savior, the vindication of the honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, we put the honorable Elijah Muhammad and presented him the way he's supposed to be presented to the world. He said, it's a vindication of him because the messenger told him that Allah would clear him and his family of all the false charges. And the Messiah, he started crying. And I had to pause because, you know, 
he was weeping, but they were tears of joy because he felt and expressed that this work was the vindication of our nation. He was so excited and overwhelmed. And he told me this, he said, brother, he said, you may not see this son. He said, you may not see it, but Allah is using you, you know, to do something really, really great. He said, you may not realize it, but Allah is, <laughs> is using you. He said it was difficult for him to see how Allah was using him for certain things, you know? So I'm just thankful. Um, and it's so good to see when you put a lot of work into something that it starts to pay off, not necessarily in the financial sense, even though we hope that, you know, <laughs> it'll pay off in that way. But the goal of this is to spread the word and propagate the truth that Allah revealed to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, because it is that truth that's going to save our people and ultimately the world. And there's no doubt about that. And we stand on that. So the minister was, needless to say, I know I talked a lot, but the minister was extremely happy. And he told me that he's looking forward to uh, the next episodes of the project. He offered to help in any way that he could. But, and I let the minister know then, because he's already done so, so much. He has taught us so much. He gave us everything that we need. It's up to us now to take what he's given us and put it before the world and present it before the world and do these productions. So I'm feeling real excited and we are working on the next one. The next one, uh, we hope to be done pretty soon. And everybody seems to be anticipating that. The next episode involves the coming of God. <laughs> it's answered, the coming of God. We're still dealing with the wheel. We're still dealing with the whole UFO phenomenon because that's what Allah answered. But he didn't answer it until he came. <laughs> so we have to deal with the coming of God. So, uh, we, uh, I can't give you an exact date just yet because we're still, you know, uh, working on it and putting things together. But as far as the first prelude episode, we have gotten nothing but the best. Anybody and everybody that has watched it gave nothing short of stellar reviews. I've had people, colleagues and associates of uh, uh, different beliefs, different races who have watched it and they really, really liked it. And they, they told me they're waiting on the next one. So uh, we, we got some good work to do and we just excited, man. We thank a lot tremendously for what he blessed us to do and what he's blessing us to do with this project. Allah Wagbar. Allah Wagbar. Law Wakbar, thank you very much for sharing that, brother. Um, the minister's uh the minister's response to it and his calling it a vindication in the way that he did, it, it, it speaks volumes just to the importance of that subject. Um, like you said, that is uh, well, not like you said, like we're taught, that is Allah's <laughs> calling card. Mm -hmm. So all praise. And you know what, brother that. Demetrius? During that same talk, and we spoke probably about 35 minutes. And one of the things, because I was going to give the lecture at Mas Mariam the next day, and he told me, he said, oh, brother, I pray that Allah pour his spirit all over you. So uh, we were blessed to deliver the message at Mas Mariam, and we got nothing but good reviews from that, too. So when you saw me at Mas Mariam, if I seemed like I was kind of confident, if I seemed like I was full of the spirit, it's because the Honorable Minister Farrakhan prayed for me. <laughs> yes, sir. Look, that's all, that's all you needed. If, if the sure. apostle said he prays that Allah pour his spirit over you, <laughs> say less. That's all you need right there. Yes, sir. Beautiful. Praise be to Allah. Um, Two things before we ask our last question, brother. Uh, 
if I could get my browser to act right. There we go. <laughs> I did want to show this picture that our sister put in the chat from the uh, 101015 Eve. I'm going to share the screen real quick of that, that cloud that the minister saw, that the believer saw that you mentioned. How clear is that showing up for everybody? Oh, nice, nice. Yes, yes. And that was right on top of the JW Marriott. And that's shortly after we were blessed to meet with the minister. We're just talking about a visitation from the wheel. And the minister replied, he said, oh, brother, it may be that we might get a visit. <laughs> and lo and behold. Yes, sir. I, I don't know who took the picture. I think it was Sister Paulette, I believe, who's the one that took those pictures. But clearly you see the Honorable Minister Farrakhan and certain family members and friends and passerbys, all of whom are, you know, somewhat perplexed over this ominous looking cloud that just kind of came out of nowhere in what seems to be almost a perfect wheel shape <laughs> that hovered over a certain part of the city before disappearing. Boy, yes, what sir. a mighty God we serve. Yes, sir. Allahu Akbar. And just a quick correction. I said sister, because I thought it was, but that was our brother Vincent that shared the picture. So thank you, brother. And you, brother before Vincent. the last question, just a brief uh, commercial break. We want to go to the master call live and remind everybody of our merch. This is our official website where you can get to the link that you're on right now. And I think because I'm on Safari, which I didn't realize, it's not showing the picture of the t-shirts. <laughs> Let me see if I can refresh it. All righty. Well, go there yourself. As far as you not being able to see the pictures, we'll just blame that on Sister Anissa because that's always the easiest thing to do. <laughs> And you will see our beautiful Master Call t-shirts and the Master Call bookmarks. Please order your merch. And come on call and show it off to everybody. Brother Javon, did we have a particular last question? Because um, I wanted to get to the one with uh, the sister's experience. Do we no. have Okay. So then I'm going to see it. Sister Nisa said the pictures are up there. They absolutely are. It's just my computer uh, tripping. So again, we'll blame it on her for now. So the last question, it says, my husband and I have been experiencing the baby planes regularly. Even when we call, even when we call on them and when we are having, excuse me, and when we are faced with perplexed situations, they appear with flashing lights or colors. Is there a guide or understanding of the different colors the baby planes show when we are trying to communicate with our brother and sister pilots? I can't say with certainty that there's a set standard of colors and their meanings. It could be on a case by case basis. But I think it's uh, a blessing that if one or two are blessed to have such interactions with Allah's baby planes, it should serve as a constant reminder that he has sovereignty over all things. Let those sightings that you and your spouse are able to see so frequently serve as a constant reminder of Allah's power and a reminder that he is with us. You know, he is real. So um, just keep that at the, at the front of our minds, the front, back side of our minds all the time. You know, keep Allah at the center of everything and stay focused on that for surely uh, one of the greatest forces against indecency is prayer, you know, and 
the remembrance of Allah. So to have constant sightings like that, shoot, some people never seen wheels, let alone frequent. So let that be uh, just constant reminders that Allah is uh, bestowing something upon you. So let's move out on his spirit, move out on his word, move out on the mission that he has with his man, Minister Farrakhan. All praise belongs to Allah, Brother Ilya. Since you answered that one a, a little quicker, um, I wanted to just ask this and then we'll close out. In your keynote that you gave, you brought up a scripture in reference to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's vision. And I can't remember what scripture it was, but you brought up a newer revised translation or version of the Bible that included a date, September 17th. Yeah. And I just want to ask, what is that scripture again, since the minister's vision is tomorrow? And then how did you come across that information? That scripture is in the eighth chapter of Ezekiel. The eighth chapter of Ezekiel, oh, uh, can't remember the verse right off the top of my head, but it talks about when this servant was being held captive and it starts using those funny words in this, this month, in the fifth month, in the sixth day, and when the King uh, Jacoyim in captivity and all of this by the rivers of Kabar, when I was lifted up in the spirit of, uh, of God to the uh, heavenly Jerusalem and it was the New Living Translation that came out some 11 or 12 years after the minister's experience. The New Living Translation of the Bible was a translation that I think came out in 96. And in these translations, they attempted to give calculations of believed or assumed dates in the modern calendar which is based on the Gregorian calendar, as opposed to what it would have been um, during those days. And it was the New Living Translation that took that scripture from Ezekiel 8, where this prophet was taken up in the spirit into the presence of God to be on September 17th. You know, we can't just make this stuff up. <laughs> you know, uh, this came 11 years after the minister's experience. The minister had been talking about it, and lo and behold, these Bible scholars who have nothing to do with the nation of Islam said that this event with Ezekiel took place on September 17th. I say, what a mighty God we serve. Yes, sir. I second that. And um, we thank you again for your time, Brother Ilya Rashad. We have, uh, if it's all right with you, just one more question from our dear sister, Anissa. She said, can you ask what has been his greatest trial in this process? When Allah grants us with a blessing, he also blesses us with a trial. If you would be willing to share um, and how you have overcome it or are overcoming it thank you so much sister nisa and thank you for inviting me what was it almost a year and a half two years ago the first time uh, <laughs> for the master call appreciate your much love to you and your family sis um naturally there are always going to be trials when Allah grants things to you or for you um and certainly I'm not immune or not without trials myself, but I'll tell you, I think I have a certain mindset that I tend to be so optimistic. I'm more of that count your blessings mindset. I'm just like that. And even though that I know I have trials, they kind of get pushed on the back burner because I have so much work to do. <laughs> it's almost like I have so much work to do in terms of for the mission that I almost forget that I look, I forgot I got some trials I got to deal with. You know, of course, you know, 
uh, finances, especially in today's age with all of this, the economy and whatnot, you know, uh, I think for everybody, ain't nobody got enough money. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Shoot. Uh, I don't know. You told me somebody that they got enough, then maybe I need to see them. But you know, it's always just a natural uh, trials that come with life. I'm blessed to have a beautiful wife and children and, you know, life be lifing. So we have to make sure everybody has things in place. Uh, one thing that I just struggle with is just the fact that it seems like I never have enough time. You know, I'm working on the second episode of Answered, you know, the coming of God. And I got all this stuff in my head. And it's like, I can never get to, to it as much as I would like to, you know, I mean, I work, we have to work like uh, everybody else and, you know, pull this, doing that, but it's like time, you know what I mean? So I wish I could be better at time management. And even though I have help with family members and things like that, they are kind of like me in the sense that they are like more creative even my wife, my wife is a creative. She's a fashion designer. So when you are in the creative modes as we are, sometimes the other more um, mathematical, strict, timely, crunching numbers kind of mode, you, I might be a little bit deficient in that. So sometimes in my household, when you have a household of creatives, <laughs> you know, we have to make sure that we, uh, pull ourselves back to having structure again because we have stuff all just all over the place. So little stuff like that, you know what I mean? But I'm just so thankful that Allah has blessed me to live in this day and time and thankful that I'm even able to recognize who his servant is and whatnot. We blessed, man. So I would encourage others to take on a certain characteristic of Brother Ilya you know, a certain characteristic. And that is, man, have that count your blessings mindset, looking on the um, brighter side of things because it makes you grateful. And when you are grateful, it a lot blesses you with a certain attitude that allows you to overcome your trials. I think I just said something right there. That may have been a bar or something, man. Let me let me say that again, bro. You know, when we are truly grateful, though, for real, when we are grateful for what Allah has done, is doing, and will do, and we know that he has sovereignty over all things, man, it kind of diminishes the problems that you have, and you are able to overcome those problems much, much better, you know? So I would suggest others taking on that mindset, too. All praise is due to Allah. Brother Ilya, once again, we want to thank you so much for your time and coming on, taking on this great topic of the battle in the sky. That was officially our last question. And if we weren't able to get into anybody else's questions, we we tried our best. Um, but definitely send a DM to the master call or you could leave them on our website. There's a question box where you can drop questions and we'll do our best to get them answered for you. Um, of course, we want to thank our dear sister, Sister Anissa, who is the mother of the Master Call. And we want to thank the Master Call staff, Brother Demetrius, Brother Jeremy, Brother Darren, Sister Jadea, Sister Rachel, for all of you all's hard work. You forgot and, Brother Javon. Huh? You forgot Brother Javon. Brother <laughs> Javon as well. Oh, praise the Lord. Um, so we want to thank you all for your time. And I believe now... We will go into our readings, Brother Jeremy. Are you ready? Real uh, real quick, Brother, too. Uh, as far as anybody who has remaining questions, also a reminder to get Brother Ilya Rashad's book. The answers may be in there. And since we're speaking on Allah's calling card, Allah's technology, pray to him for the answers as well. Oh, All great. Thank you to Allah. Before we get into our closing readings, just to let you all know, we read from the Teachings 2.0 book, a random question, and then one section from the Holy Quran, close out in prayer. But we do have just two announcements. Next Tuesday, same time, same Zoom link, we will have 
our dear sister, Sister Leah Muhammad, I believe. Brother Jeremy, if you could show that flyer. This is a longtime companion of our dear beloved Mother Tynetta Muhammad, and her topic is Faith and Endurance, Lessons Learned from Walking with Mother Tynetta with Sister Leah Muhammad, a travel companion to Mother Tynetta Muhammad, and that is Tuesday, September 19th, 6 Eastern, right here on the Zoom link. So make sure you all share that out, and we're looking forward to hear from our dear sister. And our final announcement before we go into our readings is to continue to hearken unto the voice of God, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. You can listen to all of his recent addresses on media.noy.org and also on YouTube if it's not taken down. So with that said, Brother Jeremy, you can go ahead and close us out with our reading. Yes, sir. Awesome. Like family. Uh, like and so the teachings 2.0 just opened up to page 152. The question is, when you're focused on achieving something, do you just focus on reaching that mark or you aim to go beyond that mark? The Honorable Minister was Farrakhan responds, life presents us with struggles. The Holy Quran teaches us that God created man to face difficulty. So there are challenges in life that we must, with the help of God, overcome. And there are goals in life that we set for ourselves based upon our desires to achieve. Once we achieve the goal, we don't sit around and worship the achievement. For once the goal is reached, the joy of the achievement is dying. So one goal should lead you to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, until you reach the final goal, which is a perfect reflection of God. All praise is due to Allah. And again, that's page 152 of volume one. Wow. And then let's go to volume two. All right. So this is on page 206. The question is, how can we inspire greatness in those closest to us like you do? Donald Minister was far come response. Jesus set the example by his word and deed. So those who were positively affected by his word and deed disciplined their lives according to his word and his deed. Thus, they too became doers of the word and became great in the name of their master teacher. All praise is due to Allah. And again, that's page 206 of volume two, Twitter books. Alhamdulillah. And then we can go into the Holy Quran. Oh, and uh, before the Holy Quran, since Allah has the last word, I uh, just want to make it clear that since the anniversary of the minister's more than a vision-like experience, or quite literally his visit, as we can refer to it, to the wheel, is tomorrow, you can be assured that the replay of this beautiful call will be out by tomorrow so that everybody can feed on it and celebrate the, uh, the anniversary. All praises due to Allah. You go ahead, Brother Jeremy. Pardon me, brother. Yes, sir. So I open up to chapter 36, Yasin, section four, reward and punishment. Let me know when somebody's there. You said 36, right? Yes, sir. 36, section four. Yeah. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. And the trumpet is blown when low. From their graves, they will hasten on to their Lord. They will say, O oh, woe to us who has raised us up from our sleeping place. This is what the beneficent promise and the messengers told the truth. It is but a single cry when lo, they are all brought before us. So this day, no soul is wrong in aught, and you are not rewarded aught but for what you did. Surely the owners of the garden are on that day in a happy occupation. They and their wives are in shades, reclining on raised couches. They have fruits therein, and they have whatever they desire. Peace, a word from a merciful Lord. And withdraw today, O guilty ones. Did I not charge you, O children of Adam, that you serve not the devil? Surely he is your open enemy. And that you serve me, this is the right way. And certainly he led astray numerous people from among you. Could you not then understand? 
this is the hill which you were promised. Enter it this day, because you dis disbelieved. That day we shall seal their mouths, and their hands will speak to us, and their feet will bear witness as to what they earned. And if we pleased, we would put out their eyes. Then they would strive to get first to the way. But how should they see? And if we pleased, we would transform them in their place. Then they would not be able to go on or turn back. All praise is due to Allah. Again, that's chapter 36, Yasin, section four, reward and punishment. All praise is due to Allah, family. And before we continue to close out in prayer, I would just like to greet you all as I came before you with the greeting words of peace and paradise. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Hang on, let me give the let me give the family unmuting uh real quick because I don't think they can. I want to hear everybody give the greetings. If it'll let me, Lord. Hmm. I know I'm dragging it out. It's I just did it, brother. Praise be to Allah. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam, family. All praise is due to Allah. At this time, let me see if we could turn that back off so there's no accidents. <laughs> I just did it. So we'll close out in prayer. Attention, prayer. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the Beneficent, the Merciful, Master of the Day of Judgment in which we now live. Thee alone do we serve, thee alone do we beseech for help. Guide us on the right path, the path of those upon whom thou hast bestowed favors, not the path of those whom thy wrath has brought down, nor of those who go astray after hearing thy teachings. Amen. Amen. Love you all, family. Thank you for your time. Thank you again, Brother Ilya Rashad. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.